Hello, I'm Bob Thompson, and welcome to the Victory Garden. We have a great show for you today, featuring a visit to Ghent in Belgium. Every five years, that city hosts an international flower show that Peter Seabrook tells me is the finest and most colorful in the world. Back home, Roger Swain is doing a little landscaping, and he'll be harvesting asparagus for Marion's recipe. All that and more is just ahead, so please, stay tuned. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television viewers. Grace Sierra Horticultural Products Company, makers of Peter's professional plant foods and potting soils for all your indoor and outdoor gardening needs. The American Rental Association, whose member businesses rent the tools and equipment to build a home, landscape it, grow a garden, and throw a party. And by Monrovia Nursery Company, producers of container-grown ornamental plants. Available at nurseries and garden centers nationwide. Late in April, Peter Seabrook visited the city of Ghent in Belgium. And Ghent, of course, is a city renowned for its azaleas. And in this segment that Peter Seabrook is going to show us, you'll see millions of them. Let's have a look. A very warm welcome to the churchyard of St. Michael's here in the medieval town of Ghent in Belgium. Wedged between France and Holland, this lovely old town has been the center of commerce since the seventh century. But it wasn't until the 16th century that our gardening story begins, because at that time, the good citizens of Ghent set sail from this inland port out into the world to bring back the finest plants they could find. And it was alongside the river's edge like this that the earliest gardeners started to cultivate their plants to decorate the old castles and lovely old townhouses like these. Now some 200 years later, these good gardeners thought it would be a good idea to hold a flower show and they got together about 50 or 60 plants and staged them at the local pub called the Frascati. And that proved so successful that from those simple origins was born the internationally famous Floralese of Ghent. Without doubt, the most colorful and most spectacular of all flower shows on the planet. Well, now we're bang right up to date in the new Expo Center just outside Ghent. And I did promise you the most spectacular and the most colorful show. Just look at that. Acres and acres of it. This is what the Belgians are absolutely famous for in Ghent and La Christie. These Indian azaleas in the most brilliance of reds and purples and pinks and whites. You're just seeing the first visitors. Members of the Royal Horticultural Society of Ghent and their friends. And just a little while ago, as is tradition, at this and all the previous Floralese, it was formally opened by King Baudouin and his wife, Queen Fabiola. Now, we don't have the two hours they had to wander in and out this mile and a half of paths and see the millions of plants and the countless blooms. But I'll just pick one or two of the real special things that I think will sparkle your interest. Now, the Belgians are famous for three particular crops, Belgian begonias, their house plants, and of course the azaleas. Single nurseries may grow as many as two million. And look at this particular group. Why do you think this got first prize? Every plant has flowers from top to bottom. No buds. You can hardly see a leaf. Some of them in two tiers and some of them trained in spirals. It really is a masterpiece of cultivation. And so uniform and the colors so bright. But this is the kind of thing that uh, I come to Ghent especially to see the skill these people have in producing specimens. This plant could well be 30 to 50 years old. And immediately after this show, it'll go back to the nursery. Every one of these tens of thousands of flowers will be pinched off by hand. We mustn't leave a seed pod on. And then they'll produce nice, short new shoots. They'll be pinched. And in the second year, it's grown and rounded, sets flower buds, and then it's off across Europe for another exhibition. Who knows? Perhaps in five years' time, it might be back in exactly the same place. But I can tell you, the skill of getting that in flower like that to the day is quite remarkable. And there are even bigger plants. There are just three here. 
one in a tree form with a straight stem. Must be 40 years old, I would think, to get that sort of size and spread. And then here, must be six or seven feet across and hardly a leaf. I don't know what the grower feels because this group of three got a second prize, would you believe? But this, yes, is the Belgian exhibits, but there are 12 other international exhibits. They have some pretty unusual plants too. The Italians know their azaleas. They know their terracotta pots too. Just look at the size of these and you put the two together for 30 or 40 or 50 years. But just think of the attention they need. Goodness, you need to be just checking the compost in that and watering, I think, two or three times a day in that heat of Italy. And then after all those years and all that care, hauling them halfway across Europe from Rome to Ghent. They are quite remarkable plants. Here in Hall 5, we have what is supposed to be a tropical rainforest because this is the Belgians' other speciality, tropical house plants. The philodendrons, all of those plants which grow up in trees. You remember us seeing these bromeliads in Hawaii? No roots much needed for those. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Regular little misting every few seconds to keep this atmosphere nice and damp. And these are marvellous house plants, of course, here, the Nirigelia. You get these into dark, central heated homes in Europe, and these coloured bracts will stay month after month. There's no flower there to go off. And then right beside them, the Clevia. It's amazing how they can get relatively young plants to flower so well. And then they build them up size on size. Those of you who were with us when we went to Melbourne Botanic Garden may remember that they were used as a ground cover plant there. Here, of course, a marvellous windowsill plant. They love to be baked in the sun all summer. And now, <laughs> look at this. Veresia, the variety Splendid. Did you see anything more Splendid than that? Each plant grown in a pot here, a veritable wall of them lined in between with that lovely soft grey Spanish moss. Now here's a clever piece of design. Well, it's an illusion really. You think you can see two columns, but there's only one. And of course, it's all done by mirrors really and such a big mirror that you don't see the top edge against the rest of this exhibit. It's been brought together by a cooperative. There are a number of cooperative exhibits where perhaps 50 or 100 growers get together uh, to display and to promote their particular produce. So clever though, this particular exhibit, that lots of the visitors come through don't even recognise their reflection the other end. Pretty good, eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every few yards along this mile and a half of paths, you see all kinds of things that are interesting. This caught our eye. Great big flowers, but on little short plants of these African marigolds. It's as if they're blooming, jumping out of the ground. That's the kind of thing some of these bedding and pot plant growers want. But it's used here just as a foil to the bays. This is the kind of thing you have in the kitchen. But why not make it a bit more ornamental? What the growers do is to root cuttings and then have it in a greenhouse and sweat that stem up so it's very soft and supple and then curl it round a four inch pipe and then leave it like that for a season or two until it thickens and there you have something useful and ornamental. Now the interesting thing here is that these halls could well have a car show in two or three weeks time or office furniture. What the designer has to do is get onto this straight hard concrete floor, put in his edging to hold hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of sand covered with grass and then he can get some sort of height even build this lovely little pool the kind of thing that any person might have in their garden a very popular item I suppose you could call this the wettest of all the halls shades of Versailles methinks with these great lines of fountains but over the years the Floralese has become so big and the avenue is so long, they found it necessary to put a restaurant where visitors can stop off halfway. But if I'm going to see it all, no time for me to stop. Oh, now, here's a bit of a fun. I wonder what the crowd was. A <laughs> couple, of, couple of water cannons firing backwards and forwards, and, and the speed keeps changing. That, that's great fun. I can see the school children later in the week standing here in their hundreds. Great fun.
Oh, and here's something new. This is the exhibit from uh, Russia for the first time, an exhibit of cut roses from uh, Estonia. And with all these changes going on, uh, we expect a tremendous number of imports from the east. And by the look of this quality, then there could be some good stuff coming in in the next few years. Now, the Danes, they're great pot plant growers, especially the flowering pot plants. And they're great innovators too. They're always looking for something different, something to attract the eye. And they seem to be able to miniaturize things. And they take things smaller and smaller, these little kalanchoes in thumb pots, tiny little plants. But they could manage to get a mass of flower on them. And another speciality, the stephanotis. Here we've got 25 plants, all grown on rings and round canes. And what they do is to root a cutting, run it up a six foot high string. And once it's got to the top, high temperature, starts to form a flower bud at every leaf joint and they take the string away and wrap it round those canes to get that compact plant for the windowsill. And here's a symbol that we're likely to see more and more. They're going to use this as a brand. It's shown here in plants with the Mind Your Own Business, the Helzini, and the red flaming Katie again. So we'll see lots and lots of that sign on boxes up and down the country. But the variety that they grow of flowering plants is enormous. Oh, here we've got the Exicum, the little Persian violet, beautifully scented. If only I could send that scent and fragrance to you. Oh, and look at those great big white Campanula saw raised from seed. And there's another one, Campanula glomerata. That's a hardy garden plant. Usually grows about two feet and they've shortened it for indoor use. Oh, and those Riga begonias. They can just grow those unbelievably well. Begonia elata or Riga begonias. towering from the roof and spreading in every direction the exhibit from the West Germans and it's absolutely bursting with colour all kinds of plants and no it isn't Christmas although you'd think so with the size of these poinsettia and here's an unusual colour I haven't seen anything like that a really strange sort of apricot shade and just across the avenue then we're way into the year 2000 with this swinging satellite or radar dish now this is the Dutch they're great showmen. They know you need a bit of movement to attract the eye. And look at that dish, absolutely full of all kinds of cut flowers, viburnums and lilies, gypsophila and aster. And here in the foreground, every kind of plant that you'd find on Dutch nurseries, the croton. Oh, and then outside in the garden, those rich orange deciduous azaleas with that lovely fragrance. And beneath, tulips. Oh, yes, and all the season, daffodils and white hydrangeas great beds and beds of plants, the little white doots here, and then that cornucopia of Boston fern. What more appropriate for the Victory Garden? Now, this is the main Italian exhibit, and I think the designer has been quite clever because he's used the back walls with a blue wash and that sort of white puppy cloud appearance to give the feeling of a big garden. But these showmen, they pull some tricks, you know. This hasn't been grown in pots. It's just chicken wire filled with florists, foam kept moist, and then these little tiny shoots of evergreen down here just tucked in to give the feeling of a trimmed hedge arch. And I like, too, the sympathetic colour of this paving. It seems to throw up the rich yellow of the spray carnation. Lovely thing, that. Oh, and look at that great bowl of first prize rose, Dallas. That's a great Texas rose, isn't it? <laughs> but dark red. And then we have the Dutch iris, another first prize winner and a lovely bowl or two of this year-round spray chrysanth with the green centres. And then into Alstroemeria, that lasts so well when it's cut in flowers. And I can see some people have got their eyes open just picking this lovely little tiny miniature rose, Claudia. It's no wonder, is it, that the Italians won first prize for the best international exhibit. Well, now, did you see the like of that ever? We've seen some gardens and some flower shows with the Victory Garden, but uh, there's nothing quite like this. And now's the time for you to mark your calendar. April 1995. That's when it'll be the 31st Floralese. You can be sure the flowers will be bigger and better than ever. Bye-bye. What an incredible show, Peter. I've already marked it on my calendar for 1995. Well, let's head over now and catch up with Roger Swain at the Suburban Garden. Well, welcome to the Suburban Garden and to a display of daffodils that I think rivals the American Daffodil Society exhibit at Callaway Garden that Jim hosted a couple weeks ago. Let's look at that sentinel with its salmon rim to the cup. 
And over here, a lovely clump of Mount Hood, a, a strong, true white like snow on the top of a mountain against this blue-green foliage. Now it's planted in behind a bed of threadleaf coreopsis, lovely, ferny foliage. And back here, the young growth are coming out of a viburnum. Well, the advantage of putting the daffodils in a niche like this is that as that foliage begins to die down, as it begins to yellow and energy goes back into the bulbs, it'll be hidden by this coreopsis foliage, which will grow up to be about this high at maturity. And it will shield the deteriorating, but necessary foliage of the daffodils from the viewer's eye. Well, here's a daffodil called cheerfulness, which is as much a delight to the nose, oh, isn't that nice, as it is to the eye. And behind it, the flower stalks of Burginia, a plant with coarse green leaves that evergreen came through the winter with just a little bit of burning and now this lovely uh, almost a hot fuchsia pink well everybody knows bleeding hearts but what they know are the pink form just look at this white one over here it's the white bleeding heart some people call the variety pantaloons because of its similarity uh, between a a row of ladies' knickers hung out in the line. Well, enough about lingerie. Let's go look at a new apple tree, one that's disease-resistant and perfect for backyard gardens. About the only thing lovelier than daffodils in the spring are apple blossoms, but a lot of backyard gardeners given up grind grow apples, figuring that they can never spray for the diseases and insects that they'll need to control. Well, the solution to that is to plant a disease-resistant apple. And I've chosen one that's resistant to the four major diseases, to apple scab, to cedar apple rust, to mildew, and to fire blight. It's called Liberty. It was bred at the New York uh, Agricultural Experiment Station in Geneva, New York. The original cross was made way back in the 50s when I was knee-high to a grasshopper, introduced in 1978. It's called Liberty, as I say, because it's resistant to all the diseases. You'll never have to spray this tree. Well, that doesn't solve the problem of insect pests. For insect pests, you're going to have to spray. And it's extremely difficult to spray a tree that's 25 or 35 feet high with a backpack sprayer. In fact, it's impossible. So the solution is to plant a tree who's been grafted onto a so-called dwarfing rootstock, a rootstock that keeps the tree small. And in this case, it's going to grow no more than 9 or 10 feet tall. Actually, this tree is a three-part tree. The top is the liberty, it has an interstem piece that will dwarf it to 9 or 10 feet. This is called M9 after the Malling Research Station in England where the tree was developed. And it has a rootstock piece, which is another M number, M111, which has a much more vigorous root system than does the M9 and will result in a tree that won't have to be staked in adulthood. Now, I'm planting it here in a finely prepared piece of garden, I think, too many people are planting their trees out on the edge of lawns where they can't care for them properly. And much better to put them in the, in the garden. This was mailed to me, bare-rooted, in a container with a little damp sawdust. I kept it moist, planted it immediately. I had it in a bucket of water there so it wouldn't dry out. If you let bare-rooted stock dry out, it's dead. It's a goner. So keep it damp and get it in the ground as soon as you can. If you can't plant it immediately, heal it in somewhere. Now, press this down. Now, there's a certain amount of debate as to what level to plant these at. But the general agreement is that you want to bury about half of the interstem. That is, the bottom graft union should be below ground, the top graft union above ground. This will give maximum dwarfing effect. And I'll just make the usual dike around the edge. I put a stake in next to this tree, not because it will need stakes when it's grown up, but because when it bears apples in the next two or three years, I don't want the weight of those full-sized, handsome red apples to break off the leader. So when they have apples on them, I'll be able to tie the leader up and protect it from the weight of that precocious fruit. Well, I'll just give this a good drink of water, get this tree off to a fine start. All right, that'll be a terrific addition to this garden. Every vegetable garden ought to have a little fruit in it. Well, 
Now let's go look at a collection of some of the best of modern hybrid rhododendrons. Roger Cook, our landscape contract, is putting in a dazzling bed of new rhododendrons. Roger, you're planting thousands of these every spring. What do you look for in a rhododendron from New England? Hidiness is the key. We want a rhododendron that's going to be hidey to minus 20 degrees below zero. Well, what have we got here? This is PJM rhododendron. This is the standard of the industry. This was developed by Edmund Mezzett of Western Nurseries of Hopkinton in the 1940s. Ah, well, that is certainly a very early bloomer and a, and a nice and a nice lavender purple. But there's been a lot of variations in color since then. Again, we've added a pink, which blooms about a week later than the PJM. Oh, what's this called? This is Olga Mezzett. Oh, that is. That was Peter Mezzett's wife. Yes. Well, pink and purple certainly look great here. But wherever you've got you know, where you want to plant rhododendrons, I guess white would be the choice of uniform application. People really enjoy a, a white. This is April snow. This is the early flowering one, early in April. Well, it's almost a, almost a true white, isn't it? Is this earlier than the PJM? Earlier than the PJM. Now, how is this going to get with time? What shape? You're looking at a plant that will mature at probably four feet wide and four feet high. Oh, very nice and compact. I'd call that a true white. This, I'd say it had a little old oh, peach or, or pink, perhaps, to the throat. It definitely has a blush to the, to the color, but I enjoy the flowers. Just a tremendous amount of flowers. This is Molly Fordham. Molly Fordham. Isn't that nice? And that's going to also be compact when it grows up. Uh, same, same characteristics of the last None one. None of these bare stems that you so often see in older rhododendrons. No, we try to plant them close and tight. I do like that pink. I do like that pink. Do you like that pink? Take a look at this. This is shrimp pink rhododendron. Hey, it looks just like a, sort of like a boiled shrimp, doesn't it? I enjoy the color even before the flower comes out. And then you get these nice trusses. Oh, that's gorgeous. Now, you planted these out in full sunlight. Mm -hmm. I would have thought they'd do better in shade under some branches of a tree. Little leaf rhododendrons come out in full sun and thrive in full sun. Really? Mm -hmm. Now, how about the soil? Let's see, most rhododendrons require good acid soil. pH of 6 is fine with these. Yeah, that's easy. That's only slightly acid. No, nope, that's not bad but at all. What colors are we looking for in the future? They're working on a red. It may be five years down the road, but wow, after be... that, they're working on a yellow. Well, meanwhile, with this, with this range of, of colors and this range of bloom time, that's really a, that's really a handsome spread. I want to thank you, Roger, oh, you're for welcome. coming and putting them in today. Our cool spring has meant that the asparagus has been slow coming out of the ground, and I'm afraid it actually has gotten ahead of me. I wasn't paying attention. This sphere is all the way up a couple feet and beginning to unfurl, and eventually will make fern. But if I leave it now, I'll inhibit the formation of further buds down here at the ground level. So as big as it is and as much waste as it's going to be, I'm just going to cut it off right at ground level. Now, if it hadn't begun to unfurl, I would have nipped off the top and taken it into the house. Well, here's a perfect shoot right now, just the right size. Some people like to cut below ground, but there's a chance of nicking the top of a, of a buried shoot that hasn't yet come up. And so I like to break off just at the surface, and I like to cut. I think it's neater than snapping it off, though snapping it off is a good measure of proper tenderness. The woody stems down below ground, you can peel them if you want to cook, but the skin is too tough. Well, Marion, it's going to take me a while to get a handful for you, but I'm off to get them. You know, it's hard to think of anything better than fresh asparagus from the garden, boiled quickly and served with a little bit of lemon. But when you're tired of that, it's nice to make a complete meal out of asparagus, asparagus fritters. I've taken two pounds of asparagus and I've peeled them so that the whole stalk is nice and tender. And then I've roll cut them, which means turning at one quarter turn every time you slice it. I like that for appearance and texture. And I have two pounds of those asparagus pieces and I'm going to quickly boil them. Just about two minutes should do it. Now, the easiest way to stop the cooking is to run it under cold water. Now, the trick is to get the asparagus pieces dry enough so that their excess moisture won't affect my batter. The best way to do that is to spread them on a towel and pat them dry. Now for my batter. I'm going to mix the dry ingredients together first. Now I have a cup and a half of flour, and I'm going to add about two tablespoons of a nice grated Parmesan cheese, and just a pinch of salt. Once they get mixed up, I can add the liquids, and that I have 
four beaten eggs, and I'll add a cup of milk to that. Whisk that together a little bit, and in that goes. And then this all gets beaten up until it's a nice, smooth batter. Now that's just about right. Now it's just a question of folding these asparagus morsels into the batter. Now over here in my fry pan, I've melted a tablespoon of butter and a tablespoon of vegetable oil, and I'm ready to fry up my fritters. Good spoonful plops right in there, and they're going to cook for a couple of minutes on one side, and then I'll turn and cook them again on the other side. Now, these are getting nice and brown on the edges. That means it's time to flip them. And they're going to cook for a couple of minutes on the other side, and they'll be ready. Asparagus fritters served with a green salad. A simple, delicious spring treat. Great asparagus recipe, Marion. That's our show for today, folks. Next week, Bob Smouse visits a private garden near San Diego that's beautifully landscaped with unusual plants, has a fantastic vegetable garden, and a productive backyard orchard. There'll be plenty of good garden tips on that show. Well, until then, this is Bob Thompson from the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television viewers. Grace Sierra Horticultural Products Company, makers of Osmocote time-release plant foods for all your outdoor and indoor plants. The American Rental Association, whose member businesses rent the tools and equipment to build a home, landscape it, grow a garden, and throw a party. And by Monrovia Nursery Company, producers of container-grown ornamental plants, available at nurseries and garden centers nationwide. Just ahead, find out how things work with the light-hearted, imaginative series, The Acme School of Stuff. From microwave ovens to chocolate, it's all explainable. So jump in and join the fun next. <laughs>